everyone, it's Jack from ColorHulk.com and I'm very, very excited to announce that this is the start of a new weekly video series. That's right, these are my 10 wrestlers of the week. This will happen week on week and I'm just basically gonna give you my opinion of the top 10 wrestlers from different promotions. We'll all throw them in together. Uh, whoever's had the most impressive week in terms of matches, storyline development, characters, charisma, personality, all the things that make a good wrestler a good wrestler, they'll all go into the equation and I'll just kind of work out my 10 top wrestlers of each week. And for you stats fans out there, because we're all a little bit nerdy, because we're all wrestling fans, we all love numbers and facts and figures, um, there's going to be a league table, an updated ongoing league table, and by the end, we'll have a wrestler of the year. You know, unless I've like, unless I've just run away from YouTube because of the mean comments, because you don't agree with my wrestling opinion by then, which I'm, to be honest, I'm quite worried about, because there's nothing that provokes wrestling fans more, I know, than giving your opinion as though you've got some sort of authority. So I just want to make clear, I'm not doing that. I'm not saying I've got any more authority than you. This is purely my attempt to generate some discourse and discussion by sharing my opinion with you. Cool, cool guys. Cool. Now this is going to run from Friday to Friday. Those will be the parameters with which I choose my wrestlers of each week. And I do understand that that leads to a certain problem. Namely, we've already had one week of 2018. It's already happened, but don't fear. Because just before I get into the proper format of the show and really get into my wrestlers of the week for this week, I'm going to run through last week as like an example of how the league table works. I'm going to walk you through it in very patronizing fashion. I don't know why I'm acting like I'm big and clever. I spilled Dr. Pepper on my shirt. I'm still wearing that to work, aren't I? Still wearing that. Minging. Disgusting. Now obviously, uh, week one is going to be very New Japan heavy because Wrestle Kingdom 12 was awesome. Uh, so at number 10 and number 9 for the first week, we've got two of the men in that four-way match for the junior heavyweight title. Marty Skull at 10 and Hiromi Takahashi at 9. So they get, if you see how this works, they get one point and two points. And it's going to go all the way up and then the rest of the week gets, gets 10 points. It's easy enough. It's easy. At number 8, getting three points, we've got Travis Banks because he had an excellent progress match with Will Ospreay in which he defended his progress championship. Now, I know that that match happened, I think on December 30th, so technically, you know, 2017, the week before the first week of this year, but uh, I think that was available on demand in 2018. I, I didn't see that match until then, so I think a fair way of doing this is for matches that are pre-taped, I'm not going to worry about those or take those into consideration until they're available to the general public, not just the people who attended the show. So Travis Banks, awesome match, he gets in at number eight. Three points for you, Trav. Good job, you cheeky little New Zealander, cheeky little Kiwi. At number seven and number six, we have Kazuchika Okada and Tetsuya Naito, respectively. They, of course, had the main event for Wrestle Kingdom 12, a match which many people loved. I really liked it. Didn't quite love it. I thought there were better things on the show than that, but I, I did respect it as an awesome bit of storytelling. And, of course, professional wrestling as well. Uh, I'm putting Okada in slightly lower down. He gets less points because I felt that Naito's characterization was top-notch. I thought that he was not as cocky as usual. You could see that the occasion had got to him which was excellent use of his ring psychology and his charisma and all the rest of it. So those two guys get lower, lower sort of mid table in week one, lower mid table, any other, any other Wrestle Kingdom, they might well have got spots one and two, but it was just such a strong show. At spots number five and four, getting six and seven points respectively, it is Hiroki Goto and Minoru Suzuki because they had that wonderful hair versus hair match. Suzuki lost the match, but he goes in slightly higher because of his post-match antics where he pushed away members of his stable and he went back to the ring and very honorably shaved his own head. You know, he honored the stipulation, but Goto as well, taking nothing away from him, he had an awesome performance. Two, this is really strong. This is going to be a stronger week than other weeks, i.e. this week. And number three, Will Ospreay. He gets eight points. He had two awesome matches in week one. He, uh, he won that four-way that I've already talked about at Wrestle Kingdom 12, and he also had that match that I've already talked about with Travis Banks. So any other week, Osprey would have been number one, but there are two men who did even better, and that is Chris Jericho at number two, and my wrestler of the week for week one, Kenny Omega, getting the maximum 10 pointage lads. Get in, Kenny, get the beers in, have a bit of a celly, bit of a celebration. Don't do that. I'm sure you have a very strict training and diet regimen. So you see how it works. So hopefully you've got an idea of the league table and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm just going to go straight into week two now, I guess. And then hopefully Sam, if it's not too complicated, although I know nothing about editing, so it might be what I'm asking you to do, if you could update the league table uh, and then we'll see the scores added together. But luckily for Sam, there's only one wrestler who was on both week one and week two. 
just before I start week two as well, I'd like to point out apologies to Kashida, who was also in that four-way match. The list was just too crammed to fit you in, mate, on week one. It was such a good week. Also, apologies to Cody Rhodes and Kota Ibushi, who had another standout match on the show. Any other week, these guys would have all been in the top 10. It was just that good of a week. Okay, so now we start things properly. Here we go, week two of my top 10 wrestlers of the week. This week, in fact, from last Friday to today. Number 10, here we go. Cedric Alexander. It's not as strong a week as last week, granted, because Cedric gets on this list simply because he had a decent main event in 205 Live. He defeated Tony Nese and really established himself as a major rival for Enzo More and potentially the man to take the Cruiserweight title from him. Know what I mean? How you doing? So Cedric gets one point and he moves on to the list, level with Marty Skull. You see how, you know, it's easy. You'll get Get the hang. Now there are a few of the candidates for Cedric's spot on the list. Laurel Van Ness did alright on Impact. She uh, retained her women's title, but I think I just like Cedric's hair and he's very pretty. And I think if you disagree, you're just jealous of him because he's so hot. And number nine, she only wrestled for about a minute and a half, but Shayna Baszler is the first woman on the league table because she destroyed Dakota Kai at NXT. She stamped on her arm. It looked brutal. I'm sure that Dakota's safe and fine, but it looked Awesome. Uh, Shayna Baszler, obviously a controversial figure. Many people don't welcome her because they see her as another Brock Lesnar figure, another MMA-centric figure coming in to make it look as though pro wrestling's weak. You know, it's kind of a disservice to the business in the opinion of many. But I like what she did this week on NXT. I thought her booking was very strong indeed. Just like she's probably very strong indeed. She could snap me like a twig. Number eight, Finny Finny Bala Bala. He gets three points. Finn Bala. Uh, Finn Bala, who isn't over according to some people in WWE and is over according to the fans who really matter. Luckily for Finn, he got a little bit of a surge of momentum. He was, of course, meant to be Brock Lesnar's opponent at the Rumble. That got scrapped because Finn's not over, even though he kind of is. So he's been put with the club, finally. It's only about two years too late, guys. But he's been finally put with Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson. And they had a main event match on Raw, which wasn't, like, spectacular. It wasn't brilliant. It was just a very raw main event, but Bala picked up the win and looked good doing it and hit the coup de grace. I love that move. So for, for me, that's good enough to get number eight this week. Usually other weeks it wouldn't be good enough, but week two, just a bit of a transitional week really. Number seven, another guy in that main event of Raw, Jason Jordan. Bit of a surprising one because he really wasn't connecting with the fans, but WWE have used that to his advantage almost. They've kind of turned him heel without him realizing. He came out, interrupted Roman Reigns in a very obnoxious, I'm your friend, right? Come on, I'm your friend, in that sort of way. I thought really well. Jason Jordan played this off excellently, and then again had a strong showing in that main event where he didn't win the match, he lost it for his team of Reigns and Rollins. He was kind of the loser, the nerd, who loses the match because the cool kids have had to pick him, because the teachers don't want the teams to be unequal, so they've gone, you pick Jack. No, seriously, you've got to pick Jack. He won't mess up, and then you do mess up. And then... <sighs> At number six, Marty Skrull, who was on the first week, so his points are going to get added to his total. You see what I'm doing here? You're getting the hang of, yes. This week, Marty Skrull had a match on Ring of Honor TV against Flip Gordon. I think it was the main event of the show, and it was just really cool. Really cool match. Flip Gordon looked cool, but Marty picked up the win. Um, it's, a, it's a good bounce back because his last big match saw him lose against Jay Lethal, so Marty's back on track, and he was his charismatic popular self. Bullet Club, foot foot, too sweet foot sucker, yeah, villain. Next up, his opponent in that match, Flip Gordon, a man who, like many of you maybe, I wasn't too familiar with until he started appearing on Being the Elite as kind of the fall guy for Kenny Omega and the Bucks and Cody, who were kind of like giving him harmless ribs, but they were harmful ribs. And then he snapped in one episode of the YouTube series and started super kicking them into like trash cans and stuff. Very funny, but uh, in real life, outside of that whole little YouTube world they've got going on, he's a very, very capable wrestler. He's had a few awesome matches in the past few months of 2017, and he's had a good one in the second week of 2018 as well. Even though he lost the match, I was really impressed by Flip here. Well, he did lots of flips, it's in his name, but he also did like some handstands and that as well. But no, apart from the flips, He's a very good underdog babyface, and I respect that, and I think that he does have a big future in store. Very serious point, that one, but come on, Flip. I'm rooting for you. Get up that league table in the next few weeks, come on. Now, moving on to the top four, we have Bobby Fish, Bobbington Fish, a member, of course, of the Undisputed Era in NXT, and he was a man in the foot... I'm not going to dwell on this for too long, to be honest, because everyone left on the list was in that four-way. Out of four, we've got Bobby Fish, who was a, a good component of the match, you know, he sold well. Uh, the, the heel team spent most of the match getting beaten down by the faces, and Bobby was kind of the least impressive by default in the match, but only because he had the least to do. Number three, his partner Kyle O'Reilly, who was more 
of the antagonist in the match, he was stronger, he was hitting guys with moves and submissions like he does, uh, and he was more the major threat, I feel, for the heel team. Those boys picked up the win, but I'm gonna reserve the top two spots for the two baby faces in that match, so here we go. Number two, Roderick Strong. Roderick Strong is a strange one in WWE. Meltzer cited him as one of the best pure workers in the whole of WWE, but he's never really connected with the fans to the extent that we all hoped he would. I think a lot of us who were familiar with him on the indie scene in Ring of Honor are waiting for him to turn heel because he's just a great, smarmy, like, jock heel. He's just very easy to hate. I remember he wrestled in Progress a couple of years ago, I think, and the crowd gave him lots of grief simply because he wears little boots. He's got little boots with not much of a, like they just come up to his ankles and the fans hated it. That's how easily Roderick Strong can get heat. As a babyface, I think he's very underrated, he's very resilient, and he's awesome at, you know, backbreakers and back-based offense. But in this match, that was all on display. He was very good. He was kind of the hot tag recipient. He came in with a lot of fire and did a really good job, but he's not my number one. He only gets nine points on the league table. Finally, my number one is Roderick Strong's partner in that match. Alistair Black, one of the one of the guys I'm going to say in WWE with the most momentum behind him. Yes, he recently ate a pinfall to Johnny Gargano, but apart from that, the world appears to be Alistair Black's oyster. He is surely, surely a future NXT champion, but he will have to wait until another takeover because at the upcoming takeover, he is of course going to face Adam Cole in an Extreme Rules match. That's on January 27th. It was booked by William Regal on NXT this week and I'm very much looking forward to it. I'm a big fan of both Cole and Alistair Black, and, and in this match that I'm talking about this week, Black was very over with the crowd. Everything he hit was getting a reaction. He didn't factor in the finish of the match because he got distracted by Adam Cole, who wasn't technically in the match, but was there supporting his boys. Adam Cole just sort of did his Adam Cole thing. He was a bit annoying. And Alistair Black chased him into the crowd and Cole sold it perfectly. He looked terrified. And even if he hadn't, I'd have still been terrified because have you seen Alistair Black? Seriously, have you seen him? Wow, don't want to run into him ever in my life. And partly because he impressed me a lot and partly because I'm scared of him, he is my wrestler of the week. So I guess the only thing left to do is to look at the league table and as you can see, tied for number one spot right now are Kenny Omega and Alistair Black. They both scored 10 points and sit proudly atop our new table. Well done, boys. Now, importantly, you should let us know who you think should have featured in this list in the comment section below. Your opinion is just as important as mine here. I'm just starting the debate and hopefully we can all get a nice discussion going and it won't descend into comment-based fisticuffs because that's nasty. Let's keep it civil here at cultaholic.com. Let's keep it very civil indeed. If in future weeks you want to tweet me about matches or performances you've seen that you think should feature in this series, then please do. You can find me on Twitter, at JackTheJobber. You can follow all of us at Cultaholic. You can check out our Patreon if you enjoy what we do, where there's a system of tier-based rewards. And thanks very much for giving this new series a chance. Hopefully, as it builds up, we'll get a lot of momentum going. I've been Jack from Cultaholic.com. Thanks once again for watching, and never ever forget to join us.